Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad uh, you guys succeeded finding our location. I want to introduce Henry Aids in the back row. He's with Tech Systems. They're our benefactors for this lovely space. And uh, do you want to stay up and introduce yourself? Yeah. We're going to take a break later. If you guys want to talk to him, you can. But why don't oh, you? Sorry. <laughs> what are you doing? Just run off the ball. <laughs> <laughs> if you got the lights, do you want the lights down? <laughs> Uh, my name is Tanner Gates. Um, I'm a lead recruiter um, with Tech Systems, actually on the floor of this building. Um, I primarily focus on recruiting in the InfoSec uh, role, but I uh, see a lot of different skill sets um, and recruit on all that as well. But uh, really, our goal is to build relationships with people like yourself, keep you in the loop on whatever you're interested in. It doesn't have to be opportunities, but if that is the case, you know, I'd be happy to, to talk to you a little bit further. But um, yeah, feel free. I'm going to leave some cards here. I can't stay the whole time, but if you want to grab one and shoot me an email and introduce yourself, feel free to do so. Um, but really, I like to come to these events just to learn, really. And it helps me do my job a little bit better and get to learn from smart people like yourself. So, since you're always seeing really good stuff, you need to also be some power. See, what's the key to see? The one with the first financial? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I actually go to that one uh, not as frequently as I'd like. This way, I'll be my own and just get a yeah, that's so you would have been there. Yep, yep. So yeah, feel free to introduce yourself. Be happy to meet you guys. Thank, Thank you very much. No problem. Um, so we're going to probably be meeting here for the next couple of months. Um, we'll keep it in all places. If there's any changes to that, um, Jan's been working diligently lining up uh, speakers for the next few months. Do you want to stand up and um, just give a little preview? Yeah, sure thing. In the way. Who doesn't know Alan is the president of the city? He's not so long term president. And the right, right, past president is Stephen uh, Royal, former MVP with Microsoft and just very well known in this area. Security IT professional. And he has a very successful company. So, yeah, guys, I joined recently and the team asked me to take on. Um, contacting companies and arrange uh, uh, scheduling for meetings. Uh, we have incredible lineup, beginning from InfoSec. I, mean, I know you all will enjoy it. Next month in April, we will have um, Avista Networks. Strangely, many people I'm joking uh, do not know about Avista, but it's one of the fastest growing uh, companies in networking space in the world, not just in the uh, they have their own operating system, US, and uh, a lot of devices. <laughs> they um, have 5,600 customers, among them numerous uh, 100 Fortune companies in the United States. So it will be a great presentation, uh, and I encourage to tell everybody to put word to see this by this uh, their presentation and demonstration of their operation. The next one uh, in in May will be uh, IoT Diagnostics Company. You remember uh, in our board meeting, we brought it up that we need to start looking more at uh, IoT as uh, it's uh, emerging uh, and now probably already fast emerging the portion of IT. So I talked to a few uh, IoT companies, all of those I know, or know people in the companies. And first one who was willing to uh, quickly to come um, to feel spot, close spot in it was IoT Diagnostics. Uh, this is a very interesting company. It work, mostly um, works uh, in IT security space, working with IoT devices. Um, they also offer a um, variety of cybersecurity uh, services and um, modernizing some cybersecurity software. Uh, they, they will be doing two presentations. One of these presentations will be at single security. And presentation to introduce their products and services in their very narrow niche even with IoT because they're working with IoT manufacturing. Very interesting. They will be doing for us. And in June, and this is something which no one of us, no one of us who is here, who is not here, simply nobody should miss. Will be log reason. This is uh, one of the biggest and fastest growing cybersecurity company. In the world, it's an American-based company, of course. And they will be doing live demonstration. They work with uh, security locks, for, with perimeter, perimeter devices locks. 
they combine with everything, they immediately bring it uh, and respond to uh, potential attack or vulnerabilities. It's just a little piece of what they're doing, but demonstration will be focused on this. Very effective. I, I watched this demonstration myself a year ago. It's modernized now. And the guys in this uh, company, they're very interested to work with our organization general uh, from main sympathy and with cyber security. They want us also to uh, bring more, um, uh, they want to create, help us to build visibility for our organization, so we need to put word out and make sure that all of us coming here. We have uh, Amazon coming in, in um, August. In July, we have, we have, we have a party for uh, it. Alan, Alan knows better because he, uh, but uh, in, in, in August we have Amazon coming. In September, guys, I, I just cannot tell you exactly because I have seven companies bidding with me and, uh, on, on, on September. And uh, a problem uh, among them Google, Google itself, my friend from, from Columbus, who works for Google already 11 years. Um, and we have uh, storage craft. Um, we have Nimble, <laughs> competitor of storage craft, also wants to come in. Uh, so I, I cannot tell which one coming in, in September. But the rest of the month already set. So that's what we have lined up. It's really great. Uh, everybody will enjoy it. With no regard to where we're standing with me. Thank you. So we're going to add another page on the website that will have future months so you can look at them at a time and get an idea or pass forward. Uh, also, uh, this is not something from, from my generation, but at our recent meeting, it was suggested that we get active on Twitter. So we have a Twitter account and we send it out emails to get people to see it and follow it. And look. We, is anyone active in the room on Twitter? There's two people. Well, active? Yeah. I don't know. Raise your hand. If you're active on Twitter, raise your hand. Yeah, I am. But the question is how active. No way. Just I'm, active at all. I got $2,000. Cool. All right. Anyway, the, uh, the handle or whatever you call it is uh, simpa.org, simpa.org. Uh, if you're I think that's all that I have to say, and so I will bring up our uh, speaker and turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've actually got an introduction okay, slide. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just wait until I get to the introduction slide, but uh, just because I've had to explain it a few times, I'll go ahead and explain these products and, and what exactly their purposes are and what they do, just as kind of a prerequisite for getting into this. So uh, Google Analytics is a, I guess I could say web-based analytics tool. The idea is for uh, collecting kind of user behavior and putting users into a bucket, understanding the behavior of your website and how you can manipulate that to get different results, basically. So uh, anybody in the room, I'll just go ahead so I don't dive too far. Has anybody ever used analytics tools before, and particularly Google Analytics? Okay. Yeah, I think, but no Google Analytics. Some of this might be a little high level for you guys, but I'll get more time. Oh, I'm high level for me. <laughs> um, and then uh, does anybody have the concept of a uh, like tracking tag on a website? Does anybody know just generally what tags are? Okay, so that'll probably, we'll spend a little bit more time on that in the GA part. Um, essentially what the, uh, what a tag is, is the ability to transfer information from a website to some other service. And in an instance, a tag example would be if I were to go to, you know, Simba.org and click on a button to register for something or get an email, we might want to track that so that it would be, a tag is the mechanism which will send that information off to an analytical software. When you put that later. So generally that's what those two products do. So I'm going to step into things. So a quick introduction about me. My name is Tyler Blatt. I serve as an analytics engineer on the discovery team at InfoTrust. It's called the discovery team because we try to discover new solutions within these products. So what we do is we go to companies that have analytical problems that aren't really getting solved by the market. Uh, we interview them and come up with solutions. So it's a lot of what I do is custom stuff that people have never done before. I come across a lot of problems that are like large organizational problems that don't know how to uh, approach certain situations within kind of uh, 
formulaic way of automating giant problems within their analytical data sets. So that's more or less what I do. I'm on the integration team, so we build uh, data lakes, which is you know, kind of a fancy new buzzword for combining everybody's data into a single place where there's lots of foreign keys. You can do quick lookups, and it's a data warehouse that's a bit more organized. Um, and integrations basically means uh, a lot of what I do is connecting different APIs and pulling them into those data lakes. So that's more or less my role. Uh, I have a history, as I said before, before I got into analytics. I was an MVC developer. I worked in Ruby on Rails at a Rails shop for a few years, and that was straight out of college. I went from there into this role. So I've, I've kind of lived two different lives, building the applications, and now I'm writing the underlying code for tracking those applications. Uh, a little bit about InfraTrust. So we're a digital analytics consulting and product development. We have a product. I'm not going to explain the product until the end, because for those of you that don't know tags very well, it won't make it much sense why I'm explaining why you need to inspect them until you know what they are and what problem might come along with it. So we have a product associated with we'll that a little bit later. Uh, the first part will be more about the digital analytics consulting services that we offer. Uh, we have over 4,500 sites analyzed and supported, so we, we track a lot of websites and we, we run support on a lot of different websites. Um, we do uh, 50, over 50 training programs a year. Uh, not too unlike what you guys are going to see tonight in this. So this will, is an example of how we get people started with these technologies. We have offices in Cincinnati and Chicago, uh, in Barcelona, and in Dubai. We also have remote employees in uh, Florida and a few cities in California, and all over the country. So uh, we're, we're pretty widespread. <coughs> so an example of some of the, wow, that's crazy, that doesn't matter up there. Some of the images you can pull down. So I'll, I, I got on the top of my head, but uh, some on the right are some of our uh, clients' uh, scripts: IDG, Raycom, Gaia, Wattpad, Thomson Writers, Oriel, PNG, Nestle. Uh, that's just a name. A few uh, Planet Fitness uh, are some of the images that I'm pulling. But um, the services that we're generally offering are to increase the ROI of their web-based traffic. So how do we make you more money? or get you more customers, like if you're a, uh, a new site, obviously, uh, they might have a subscription base, but it might, they might just make money on ad revenue from seeing articles. So ROI can mean different things. We work with some uh, cost per good sites, which are more just brand awareness. So like if you think like Procter & Gamble, uh, they don't actually sell Head & Shoulders online, but if you go to a Head & Shoulders website, get a coupon that might drive sales. So uh, those are CPG companies. So ROI can mean a couple different things, but generally we find the way that they make money, we optimize it on the internet. Through these tools, so it's not return on investment, not necessarily the ROA stands for return on investment, but it stands for something else. You suggest the 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 ROI is generally what they're putting in the website versus what they're getting out of it, and customer behavior. So how do you uh, and marketing channels? We'll get the marketing channels, which is the investment. So if you're spending money on AdWords, uh, AdWords is basically the the program that when you type something into Google and the first three results are this is a paid ad. AdWords is how they get the service in which they get to the top there. So when you think of the spend on AdWords or Bing or, uh, or, or Facebook ads or all these different places that are funneling into this website, mm -hmm. we're going to use information to kind of put those users into buckets, understand the behavior, and then analyze it from there to how we get, uh, if one's performing particularly well or one's performing particularly bad, understand where they're landing, what the behavior is that's causing that. And that's what like, the analytics part comes. So mm -hmm. a lot of what I'm going to cover today is how do you collect that data? How do you understand that data? How does the software work? Like, yeah, how is it cut up in the different pieces? What are the, the technical components to the software uh, towards the end? Of it? That's the analytics part. The GTM part is how you actually get that to work at the website and pass that information in. GTM is the software which we'll use to install on the web page and start that tracking. So that's kind of the overview of how all of this will work. But we do a lot of different stuff with them too. We have a, a full data science team that um, We'll take this data and we predict like Bayesian statistics to predict what's going to happen in the future. So you see this kind of information going on. Uh, we might know that you're going to have a user drop off in the next month or that if you do this, it'll cause X behavior. Uh, we do data science work around um, basket analysis. So if you add this product to your cart, we know there's this much likelihood that they would add this product if you showed it to them. Like 90% of the time they sold this, this product was also linked to that. So what products go well together? What products should you start pairing with the predictive engine to kind of get what's going to be sold together? So we do kind of data science services, reporting service, and just general data collection services all kind of mixed in. And generally, that's what pretty much everything on that list is, is eventually going to do. 
Oh, there it is. It was like half a slide there. So the first thing we're going to talk about within Google Analytics is like how it's cut up structurally. So when you get into the software, uh, how as a as a business would you look at one instance of, of a Google Analytics account? So Google Analytics, you're going to have users obviously that have to access that, but how those users interact with generally how the um, the interface is set up. You're going to have accounts, which is just the overall. This is an instance of an analytical property. So uh, a company will have an instance of an account, and then uh, you're going to have properties, which properties at the end of the day are a website, a mobile app. It's the thing in which you're collecting information against. And an account, so let's say, uh, I'll use Planet Fitness as one of our customers, so that's a good example. Planet Fitness would have an account, but for each individual store that has a website, they're going to have a property for each one. So these are the instances that are collecting information. So the properties are, you know, if you don't want Planet Fitness Texas with Planet Fitness Cincinnati uh, collecting their information in the same place if they're owned by two different businesses and sort of franchise things. So it, it's a way to silo those data with each instance of the thing that you're collecting against under a whole uh, kind of uh, overarching group. Does it allow corporation to compare code? You can, you can. It does. So that's called a roll-up property. And, and what that is is, so if you wanted, so um, like the L'Oreal is another one of our, our products, or, or another one of our uh, customers. So what they'll do is they have groups of brands that like they lay the group and then put them together. So in a company like that, that might have a couple groups of a brand and then want to see that individual group all rolled up together. So say it's their luxurious group or it's their like you know cheaper group or whatever, and they want to see them. It's called a roll-up property, and you can actually uh, you have to reach out to Google to do it. You can't create it yourself, but you reach out to Google and say, I have. This property, this property, this property, this property. List them all off and say, I want those to be treated as a roll-up property. And they'll actually go out, combine all those together, and then you're able to view them as one aggregate group so that you can look at total sales. It'll also, one of the advantages of that is you can see unique users, and uh, you'll see users that cross over from the different sites when you get that roll-up property. So uh, Google's pretty good at tracking who an individual is. So uh, they'll know if you've got you know, 500 users on this one and 600 users on this one, but then when you do the roll-up property, you only have, instead of 11,000 adding them up, you've actually only got 800, you know, you have a pretty good crossover of those users, if that makes sense. And then uh, views, the last level, is a way of kind of cutting up the, the property. So uh, in, in an individual view, you might want to only track the home page for some reason, or you can essentially set up rules or filtering systems to, to cut up the information being tracked. So the information is always tracked at the property level. When you send a hit up to the service saying, I want to track, you know, I'll get into the different types of hits, but like a page view or a certain event, I want to track this thing going on. Um, uh, the views are ways of cutting up those hits into kind of organized ways. So you might want to filter a view that is only people that came from a certain type of ad link, or it's only people that come from this certain type of device or different things, but you can basically cut those views up into different patterns for reporting purposes. So this will kind of reiterate some of what I just went through. But essentially, account is the, the access point and the topmost level, so it's a, the highest level that you have in your organization, and it will cut down from there. Uh, so, and like I said before, a property, an example would be a website, mobile application device. It's, it's the thing in which you are tracking the gains. So the way that he's described a view here is that it's an access point for, for the reports in which you're reading the data. So it's, it's essentially a set of instructions to read against that raw data that is the property. You can think of the property as being like information that it's processed, but it's sort of this is without setting a set of rules against it. It is just the data that was collected and the view has had a set of rules put against it so that you're seeing it in a certain format that is for a certain purpose. So getting into how does this actually work, how do we collect the data? Uh, this is the example script tag, sorry if that's hard to see right there. Um, this is an example script tag of how you would define Google Analytics on a page. Uh, we're going to do, if we have time I'll actually get into the JavaScript of what's happening behind everything. 
but the one part of this is how we're going to do it through GTM, where it kind of auto generates that JavaScript, extracts it, and makes it a little bit simpler. But for people who like to debug and find out why something's not working, I'll break down the actual JavaScript behind and what's going on. Uh, so when we actually do it through GTM later, and I show you how you would add a Google Analytics tag through GTM, uh, this is basically the code that would be auto generated for you. Uh, it gets put into the header. Uh, or, or slightly in the body right after the header. The worlds are kind of, Google has their recommendation, and then the developers have kind of talked about what they want as well in that world. But generally, at the end of the head, top of the body, it's all timing issues that people fight about in the, uh, in the loading of the HTML group. Question. Yes, sir? Then you just put this in the page that you want to pull analytics from and don't put it on every page. It's going to be everywhere because generally with analytics, you're going to want to have it everywhere. When I get into the concepts of sessions and page views, which are a couple slides ahead, that'll make a little bit more sense. But uh, And also, I'll go ahead and answer that with the next slide. So GTM will handle that for us. Same rule I just said about where you're adding that analytics code. You would add GTM, which GTM is going to fire that analytics code. GTM stands for Google Tag Manager, by the way, uh, the other product. I just always hit the shorthand. Um, you would add the GTM sn snippet same places, uh, and it's going to, essentially what it does, I'll just go ahead and explain this from a technical perspective, because I think that'll land with most of you. Uh, it's a giant compiled, midified version of JavaScript that takes templated purposes into midified JavaScript and does the things that you wanted to do. For, for example, when we go into the interface of GTM, we're going to say, I want you to fire a page view tag in a form that's not too unsimilar to TurboTag. Click. I have this code, fire this thing. We're going to go through that interface and how it works. But essentially what GTM is, is, is extracting this tagging, this tracking of all these different softwares and APIs and things that people have to connect to, putting them in an interface, turning that interface into a, a minified <coughs> JavaScript file that's very small and tight and composed, and pulling it all in with its instructions of when to fire and how to fire and where it's supposed to go onto the page so that rather than having to keep track of all this JavaScript everywhere and this mess that becomes data collection and putting it into a nice tight place that will connect everything for you. So um, in a nutshell, GTM is basically just one huge JavaScript file. And it's one that you've kind of structured through your own set of instructions. And you're going to want to have that everywhere because generally when you get into the tracking world, you're going to have the GTM snippet on every page because there is something you're tracking every page. And there's a concept of uh, when they bounced off of your website from most tracking things, and the bounces when they left or did not get those hits anymore, and if they stopped getting those hits because they just went to a section of your website, it'll kind of give you incorrect information. So this is generally like kind of a, a high level visual that might help somebody on how the information gets collected. So your website is loaded and then that JavaScript that we were just looking at, that snippet gets loaded on the page. And the first thing it's gonna do is set cookies. Those, those cookies are a purpose of tracking your individual user. Uh, so who you are to this data set so you can understand on the user level. Uh, and how long you've been there, what brought you there, that kind of thing. So just basically stateful information about this instance of this web session. Uh, they send hits to Google through GIFs their way of it, it's hacking a post command. So rather than having to write JavaScript and send a post request, you just load an image. So if you load an image that no one can see, it's the fastest way to, without writing a lot of code to basically send a post to an API. Um, so they'll load a series of GIFs with different instructions in them. It's basically query parameters and a string URL that's sending your event information. Uh, so that data is consumed by Google servers, gets processed and aggregated, uh, and then you are able to go through the interface through your, your views, or if you're someone like me as an engineer, I'm typically using the APIs to consume this data, not looking at it from the actual views. Uh, once it's processed, GA has a four hour processing window for all hits, so when you send a hit, you can see it coming in real time, but for it to run through some of the back end processing to put them into certain buckets, you're able to validate that the hit came through, but to see it actually in its final process form takes four hours. But this is basically a visual of the life cycle of how that might work. This is an example of the uh, cookies that were set. So GA will set all of those underscore GA cookies that you're seeing on the left are um, cookies that are defined as soon as that script loads for that individual user. So uh, the underscore GA cookie is your user, basically. It's who you are. 
to Google Analytics. So that cookie is used to define if you're a unique person. So it's unique users for like two years, and that's how they distinguish users. So it's a long cookie time. And then uh, the underscore GAT is for the throttle request rate. So it's just basically how fast you're sending information. You said with a long cookie time? Yes. You mean like when somebody erases their cookies all the time? Um, there's another concept called client ID, which is the way that they're trying to identify you. It's not foolproof, but it's pretty high. So you're more than likely going to get that same value back, but it could potentially change. I don't want to be identified. Then your best bet is to block cookies all the time. And then you're more than likely just going to have, if you block network requests, let me circle back to that. At the end of this, I talk about data security and how it's changing. I have okay. a couple slides on oh, it. Yeah, and that it'll make a lot more sense because have you heard of GDPR and the it, the general data protection regulation yeah. by the EU? Yeah, you know, we might. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll go into GDPR and then uh, the certain browsers are getting into the fight and how they're going to collect, and we'll talk about how that world's going. Okay. So we'll get to that, but yes, uh, that this that would throw a wrench not having cookies in, and people who block cookies tend to have different tracking. So this is, I'll go through this pretty quick because this isn't too hard of a concept, but essentially uh, a session is a session for a user. So you want to track how often users are coming to your site. So you define the amount of time in which a user being on your site would be considered a session. That might be a metric you want to say, how long are people spending on our site, but how long does someone need to be inactive before you can say, okay, this is the joker. They're done with the site. They were no longer in this visit. Uh, the general time is 30 minutes they're put on. So the way that that's done is you have a cookie that lasts for 30 minutes. Each hit that you hit, cookie refreshes for 30 more minutes. If you ever have a hit and that cookie's not there, session's done, start a new session. So uh, essentially these next couple slides are just kind of explaining that concept, so I'll go through this a little bit quickly so we don't spend too much time on this. But basically, if you ever have a hit that is more than 30 seconds apart, you'll be treated as a second session. For the sole part, you, you'll need to understand how long your customers are on your website, what is the amount of time that they're typically spending between hit to hit, and try to find that sweet spot, but for most people, 30 minutes is fine. So this is what Google won't track, which is probably uh, somewhat of a comfort view, but not completely. Google will straight up shut down your data and just purge it. You have an amount of time in which you can stop tracking this or they'll just rip it out. Uh, if you ever have anything that's tied to a specific person, personally identifiable, we treat people as groups. We want them to be like, you know, like if a person came from this source or had this certain type of behavior, put people into buckets, never track an individual, you track buckets of people. So the whole point of this software is you want to basically make the websites better for the products that you're using without being kind of invasive. And there are ways around that that people do, which I'll talk about. But uh, in the actual Google service, uh, this anything that's listed up here would be personal identifiable information. If they recognize that as being in there, they'll give you an amount of days in which you can purge that data, or they just kill the property in your data. Yourself. So there's a couple of different hit types that can be sent to GA. I talked before a page view. When you asked what code, where the code should be, is it only on the pages where you're running analytics? Uh, you essentially want to have a page view on every page. That's how you're managing sessions, how people are leasing your site, what what's getting you to the point that they're leaving, and understanding the behavior of what what's driving people in, what's driving people out. Did I did they do what I want them to do while they were here? So you want to have that holistic view. So a page view is what needs to happen on every page as early as possible so we can get that information of, uh, of each page and kind of it sets the precedent of keeping that session alive and then what events happen on this page is the identifier that content was loaded, now what happened. Um, event tracking is basically almost anything else. Uh, any interaction with the page, clicking on a link, um, filling out a form, uh, we throw events for the percentage scrolled on a page. So before onload, we'll tell you how far. That's huge for news sites. Uh, they want to, did you make it all the way through the article? Things like that. So um, uh, an event is basically any measurable engagement with that site. The program distinguishes if um, somebody hit, hit this website, access one page, move to different page, and return to this page. Is it two hits uh, uh, of, of this page or is one? Uh, it would be two hits. 
the whole paper trail, all the way through. So, so if, if, if you change page and you get into page, uh, it's two keys. Yes. There are people that get in the game of, we don't do this too much, but like time <coughs> on a page to consider being a hit. So like if the page hasn't completely loaded, uh, but 90% of the time what people are doing is trying to load as fast as possible because you're trying to beat the people that click faster than the page loads. So you're trying to collect the data before, uh, like um, I think of an example, if you're like on Best Buy and you're going to click the first TV and it comes down and you click the TV immediately before that GIF had a chance to send the information out. Now it looks like you just skipped the page and the paper trail is not possible. So uh, yeah, basically what they want to know is if you keep re-engaging with the page, like that example that you're talking about. So like let's say I went to, uh, e-commerce is a perfect example actually. So let's say if I was going to buy a dishwasher, I go to a dishwasher page that lists all the dishwashers then I click on one, and then come back to the page that lists all the dishwashers, and then click on one. You can see that trail of how I went in and out, in and out, until I found what I was looking for, and then left. So they can know that when someone interacts with this dishwasher page and went through four products, by the fourth one, this one's usually performing really well, and then they'll leave. So this is the last click product, and 90% of them, maybe we should move this to the first product, or move it further down the line, yeah. so another product gets seen, but that's where you get that information. So each individual page view will be treated as individual for that purpose. So you can have that complete paper trail, kind of reverse the behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, E-commerce hits are <coughs> uh, basically what I was just saying. Uh, when anything with the, the concepts on, uh, the, uh, the concepts on e-commerce are, uh, you have add a cart, remove from cart, we're all familiar with. Uh, you have an impression, which is seeing a product, and then a click, which is clicking on that product. Then once you click on a product, it usually gives you a zoomed in, like this is what this product is. That is a detailed impression. So it usually goes impression, I see the product, click. I'm now looking at a detailed impression. Then I do an add to cart. Then you have an idea of, or a concept of checkout state. So you have checkout step one, two, three, four and then eventually conversion, so a purchase. So if you look at a product life cycle in e-commerce, you can look at a funnel for any individual product of how often it was seen, how often the product was clicked, then from the detail, clicks and details should always be the same, because if you click on it, it should take you to the detail page, but it's in the funnel. Uh, and then how often it was added to cart, you can see how often it was removed from cart, but it doesn't belong in that funnel. And then at which checkout steps did people bounce out? Did they leave? How many people are getting to checkout step four, looking at the cost, looking at the shipping, and then just leaving? So you get a concept of, uh, are a lot of people leaving my checkout and not giving me money for some reason? And then ultimately how many times that thing was converted. So uh, for, if you're an e-commerce business or you're doing this for an e-commerce business, that's where a lot of the insights can be found is uh, what particular channels or buckets, like I talked to when we put users in buckets, are leading to certain behavioral things that I want to eliminate or replicate. If I can say every time somebody clicked on this Facebook link with this ad, they made me an extra $20, we'll start blasting out that link everywhere and, get, and drag that up, but basically, uh, for the, those are the different types of e-commerce hits that, that you can identify and analyze against. And then social interaction hits. So that's, again, I'm using the example of news, but that's more like newsy places and things that are trying to get their brand out. The way they make money is by having their brand out and things coming back to them. Uh, or CPG, like I talked about, so they'll have higher uh, social click tracking and it's essentially just how are we getting shared is basically what social click tracking is. Yes. When you said how it, how the information is shared, but does it determine whether it's positive or negative in the comments? Not really. No. No. Um, it's more or less just the action of being shared, okay. not even text. Uh, text is even harder to. I don't know. This is the right analytical tool for that. I think that would be better approached. It's not something that InfoTrust wouldn't dive into, but it's definitely not something I don't think that Google Analytics would dive into just because I think if you were looking for that information, that's better suited for the APIs of those individuals. So you could find out how often somebody is, it's more frequency within those, but then uh, I'll just use Facebook as an example because I've been working with their APIs recently, but I would want to go through Google Analytics to see engagement with Facebook and what's driving it, and then go into those channels of Facebook or those actual posts, and then try to run through some kind of text engine that reads positive or negative to that API and then understand within the platform. Yes, sir. Sorry, I have a question on that. Yeah. How easy is it to just get people's posts on Facebook? Pretty easy. Okay. Well, it depends. It, it, do you know the person or are you crawling? If you know the person, easy. If you're crawling to find somebody, Facebook's pretty big. And if you can think of it as being like a web, right? Yeah. That's like through connections to find. So you, if you're crawling, it would take a lot longer. But if you're uh, 
if you're just going through like their, I think they call it their Insights API or their Graph API is what it's called, uh, the Facebook Graph API. Uh, it's pretty easy and it's documented like by three year olds, but it, once you figure it out, it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you have to be friends with them or no? Or... Uh, if they're public, no. If you if you would know the person, because then basically if you could get to it on the web, you uh -huh. get to it through the API. That's that's generally the rule because the, the token's tied to you. Yeah. So it's like you viewing it, but uh, as long as you're not interacting with it, they probably wouldn't know that you were crawling it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, that's it's more or less, it's called the Graph API, and you'll have to create a Facebook developer's account in which you bit a developer token, uh, and they've got code out there for Java, Python, which uh, sample code stuff that gets you started, and then they have like uh, Facebook Graph API Explorer, which is essentially a user interface where you can pass your token in and do you know, fake requests over, not fake requests, but requests through the interface. And then at the bottom, you can click a button that they'll give you a snippet of code for whatever request that you generated, and then you can go execute that. So. What does Graph API mean? I have no idea, it's just what we call it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, that's the Facebook Graph API. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yep. So I think the previous page which I skipped through was basically the same page views are everywhere, which I've found in the constant. Uh, I tend to go a little too far in deep, so we might skip to the slides I've already talked about. <laughs> uh, we talked about this a little bit already, but one thing that I didn't hit on that's kind of important is this category action and label uh, and value. So uh, every event, everything that you pass in is in this like kind of hierarchical tier. So uh, a category might be header click. Or, or just uh, yeah, header interaction, and the uh, action might be click, and then the label might be the URL that you clicked. That way you can see from, you can filter with looking at events by category and see everything that was in that category on an aggregate. And then from that category, was the action often click, or was it middle mouse click, or what other things that you could have done to interact with that? And then ultimately, under the labels, which ones are coming out of those combinations of actions. So you want to look at sections of your website of behavior you're trying to kind of clump together and set them within that, that hierarchical structure of category and then within that category subsets of actions so like you know form fills or different things that might, you might be interacting with within that category and then a label for that specific thing so you can have all the forms competing against each other all the link clicks competing against each other that kind of thing so if you want to make, and that is very much not heuristical. Like it will not fix it. It will not learn how to fix mistypings. So if you have to have those correct, or you'll have two different categories: one with a capital C and one with a lower C, that kind of thing. So uh, those do need to be done. But you can fix with filtering, but you can't historically back fix it. So I'll get to stuff like that later. But yeah, the, the strings do matter on these. So if you want them to roll out nicely, they need to be exact what they were. Sorry, I have a question about that again. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is the JavaScript, is that, I guess the JavaScript and the, the image that the, the Git initially, yeah. I guess can you, I, I might have missed that, I apologize if you're repeating yeah. yourself. But like, could you explain, so does the JavaScript load on the page or is it a call that pulls in JavaScript? So what exactly happens is uh, you, you add that snippet, which you do through GTM, and whether, I'll just, I won't even use GTM for this example. You add the snippet, and then you would add, a, that defines an object, a JavaScript object on the page view, and then that takes in language not too unsimilar to what I'm saying. So you would do GA, and then that GA is a function, it is an object that you can call function, so it's GA.send, and then within that send function, you're gonna pass page view, and that sends a page view. What that page view function does is generate the GIF. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you would call like GA dot sent event with a category action and label. What that does is send it generates a GIF that sends an event hit, and that object will keep track of. We're going to get to the metrics and metrics later. Uh, that object will keep track of all of the different things you might be tracking alongside of them, <coughs> and then send those GIF hits off to you. And all you're doing with uh, earlier when I said. Uh, you have an account, but everything is tracked at the property level. You have a property ID. That object maintains the property IDs in which you're sending those GIFs off to. So you're basically giving it an address and a set of information. It generates a GIF that sends off the hit to you know Google servers and processes them based on that information. So, so essentially, like the page has a JavaScript, and that JavaScript sends off these GIFs anytime yeah. anything happens. Yep. Exactly. So your 
when I first started doing this, we weren't even using DTM that often, so what I actually did, and for one of our larger customers, they were, uh, when you get the new technology fear, they didn't want to, so I was basically maintaining a giant piece of code with a set of instructions to run these JavaScript commands on like 600 different websites, and I had to maintain what those instructions were with a nest of all the different JavaScript options that might be coming through, but yeah, it was originally done with vanilla, and you were basically just collecting different information, storing it in this object, and then based off of this class structure, uh, jQuery clicks on this class, run this line, this kind of thing, and, and set up for different events and pages, that kind of stuff. Yep. Okay, I, I kind of just skipped over the e-commerce thing because I went all the way into that and there wasn't much on that slide. Um, mm -hmm. This is an example of the social interaction hits that, that could be coming through. You basically can set what the action was, the targeted thing in the network, but uh, typically for even for a lot of these things, I haven't seen this used a lot, uh, people will typically just use events and like what I said, uh, just go to the actual social network to interact with these a little bit more. Um, a lot of the uh, kind of social analysis is done through uh, source medium campaign, which we're going to get to in a little bit, which is one of the ways that you can kind of understand how traffic's coming in and separate them into buckets. So those hits are basically the bread and butter of how Google Analytics works. So it's, everything is, falls into one of those categories that you're trying to do within the web. It's like on a high level, kind of simple way of cutting things up. But then every business doesn't have the same use cases. So what information are we going to add onto this? So we'll get into dimension of metrics. So these dimension of metrics are basically like data that describes what's going on with this particular user. So what's their city and region? Again, like I said before, for tracking, they don't get down to PII level. You're never allowed to put an address in. But you can go down to city is about as low as it'll go for putting people into buckets. So I can know, you know, I'm doing really well in Cincinnati. Uh, obviously, like if Simba had a website, that would probably be where they're doing the best is in Cincinnati. So, but you can understand your regions and where people are uh, doing the best. Uh, referring traffic source, we'll get into how they do that in a little bit, but also you want to know where your business is coming from when people are coming to the website. So like if you started a blog and you want to put Google Analytics on, one of the quickest insights a lot of people would get is where are people coming from? Are they going to Google? Is it just organically coming from Google? Are they being linked from another blog? Like, what is, how is my resource getting out there? Why are people coming to the things that I'm creating? Uh, that's usually a quick attraction of people that are kind of new to this, is just generally understanding why are people coming to my site? Uh, you can get that from referring traffic source. Uh, browser type's a good one. IT teams like that a lot, because then they get a good sense of what, what browsers are, do I still need to support that are coming to it? And I've still seen like IE6 and stuff, so it's out there. And there's IE6? Yeah, IE6 has a, uh, they have a built-in SSL downgrade. You can't actually, it was built into the code, so you can't reverse it. I always think that's the funniest thing. Yeah, IE6, you actually will always have an SSL downgrade attack, so no SSL on IE6 is actually SSL. It's not to do with analytics, but it's a fun tidbit. Um, Sorry, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, how do you know, how does it track where someone came from? You like, mean like location? No, 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 uh, previous website. Uh, it's the refer, so when you click on a link, it, it's, a, it's a JavaScript field. Oh, so okay. if you go into uh, if you go into your JavaScript console and type window, uh -huh. uh, window is an object that is just basically holds stateful information about this kind of thing, and one of the things in window is the previous site refer, oh. how they got there. So if, now let me let you know, that's if you clicked on a link. Yeah. If you just go to like, let's say you're on reddit.com and then you decide to go to YouTube, YouTube has no idea or that you were on Reddit before. If you typed in www.youtube, you don't have a refer because you just came there naturally. But if you clicked on a link on Reddit and it took you to YouTube, then YouTube know, or Reddit knows you came from YouTube. Or what, I said that backwards, but I think you got to take it. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. What about after they read your blog, can you tell where they go? Uh, See if you're inspired them to do something. Yeah, if you have links, and then they clicked on that, you would be able to track that through events, but again, if they're just typing in the address bar, we, that, that would be, uh, he definitely wouldn't want that tracked. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a way to do that, nor I don't think people would like it. I don't think anybody does that. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, that would be, you'd have to have your own Very browser invasive. and a huge user base. <laughs> there's also probably some privacy concern. Yeah, yeah. Um, but generally, metrics and dimensions, other pieces of information tied up to a user. Now, these are all predefined user metrics and uh, 
are, are just metrics and dimensions that are defined by Google and they're just gonna be there for you from your data from day one. So these are things that you can just start adding to your reports and they're there. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of what a report might look like. So this is a source medium report, which I don't know why that I have this in here before we actually get into what source medium is, but um, essentially uh, this is, a source of medium is the source, the website that they came from, and then the medium is like how they got there. So uh, I'll do my best not to block the whole screen, but Google Organic, they went to Google, clicked on them. That's it. And then Bing Organic, same thing. Uh, Facebook referral means they went to Facebook, there's a link pointing the back of the site, so they didn't just actually get there, they found like an actual referral link through, and that's m.facebook, so it was a mobile. Um, email password reset, I guess I know a lot of password resets on this uh, particular instance, but uh, there's no medium on that because they just named the source email password reset to put them all into a bucket. But like I said before, that's how we're cutting users into buckets and then finding out information on it. So how many, that's hilarious, that's definitely not right. How many email password resets on new users? That doesn't make any sense. But uh, the, basically you can look at each bucket, like are we getting new users from Google Organic or are people using Google Organic to come back to our site? Are they they're a returning user? Uh, how many sessions did we get from each piece? Like where are people coming from and staying on our site? So you might get new users and then higher sessions, so that's people that are staying on your site longer. Uh, uh, the concept of a bounce rate is, I, I explained what a, uh, what a session was earlier with that 30 minutes between hits. A bounce rate is if they don't do something You've called an interaction. With each hit, you can say this is an interaction or this isn't an interaction. So they're like goals that somebody interacted with the site in some level or form without leaving. Uh, a bounce rate is if they don't have an interaction hit in their entire session and then leave, they bounce. They didn't interact with the site at all. Something happened that they didn't like that page. If you see a page with a high bounce rate, good chance you're missing content, there was nothing there, something's going wrong with that page, or tracking is not correct, something like that. But that's a good way to identify it problem areas is higher bounce rates. Uh, the, the, obviously some other metrics here like uh, pages per session. We're going to get into goals in a little bit, but they, uh, you can add goals on as other like columns here. Go ahead. Uh, could, you, could you give us some bounce rates? Like I have no idea what a good, good or bad bounce rate is. Uh, I wouldn't say, it depends on the field that you're in. Because like uh, you think about Try to use an example. Let's say the Reds won the World Series. You want to read an article. But they're going to go to that page and just read the article and leave. So what does that site call a bounce rate? In, in that industry, I'm more than likely not going to read other articles. At least me. I'm not somebody that would stay and keep going. That, there might, that person might exist. So you have to understand your user base and what their behavior is in there and what's to be expected where it's different. Um, I would say if you're ever in the 90% so it's terrible. Like you don't want to be in the upper 90 percentile. Uh, safe is like mid 50s. Like even like down here, this is a 90 percent bounce rate. That's something's going wrong here. It's either tracking or they're somehow not able to leave that area or there's not the right set of interaction events. But I would say something's probably wrong or people are really upset and leaving 90 percent of the time. Where most of this shakes out between 20 and 50. And I would say even depending on what you're selling and whether it's hard to convert on, it could go up to 60, 70, but uh, it, it really just depends on understanding your customer base and what should be going on. You talk about all these organics and, and bounce rates and click throughs Is there a way to tell that that's really people versus some sort of bot? Yeah, they have automatic bot filtering with Google. It's the same what we were talking about earlier, so uh, I'll in the room and we were talking about Google while they're optimizing their search engine, which is where it's kind of like uh, you know, military technology getting better. Google's technology gets better based off their SEO, their search engine. That's where a lot of their starts came. And uh, with their search engine, as they were optimizing the search engine optimization, how they're putting different rankings of different search results, uh, they basically, websites like Mechanical Turk, where you can hire people to hit the shit on your link for five minutes and hit it 10,000 times and make your number of hits look better. They started identifying machines and like you basically have to use VPNs and a botnet to make it look like you're more people. And if that botnet still does similar actions, then they're able to identify that it's a botnet because these so 10,000 machines do the same things. Years. Exactly. So they use that, that kind of identifying from the search engine optimization to identify what are bots. And it's a literal button when you're setting up your account, like check on bot filtering, which it's auto checked on, and I don't know why anyone would want to check it off. Um, you can actually do that at the view level, though, when I was talking earlier about cutting in views. 
So your raw property, your property with just information, you can say, I don't want any filters, I don't want any bot filtering. I will, I will accept hits coming from other website that somebody, Joe Smith with his JavaScript, just started sending hits to my property. Uh, you can have a, a view that is just wide open. And then, uh, so the property is collecting that raw information, and the views, which this is a view that we're seeing, you can start putting filters on that information. So you can say, okay, now I want the bots filtered out. And you can actually get an idea of how many bots are hitting your website and where they're coming from. Get an idea, it'll, and then you can get regional information and that kind of stuff. So it's actually almost a tool to identify. So let's go to false positives. Look, if somebody got a web page and um, a good website and yep. going between pages and stay, stays for hours there, and that is, does it show that uh, high interest or it shows that a uh, website is poorly designed and a person cannot find it? Website. Sometimes still, it, it, there is interest for something. So how how will you put in this one? You have to analyze the behaviors and groups. So if it's a fault positive and it's an outlier, we almost don't care. Because it's just one guy. And see, but if there's a C of that type of behavior, yeah. you need to know why it's happening. And that's not always answered by the analytics. What the, the best thing you can do in that situation is identify the bucket of behaviors that we understand this is happening in a large group of people. And it may think that it's good or it may think it's bad. It's up to the, I'm an engineer, I don't do as much of the analysis stuff. I'm more or less the guy that gets the information there and then hooks everything together. But that's more or less the job of InfoTrust analysts is to look at these behavior patterns and understand are they good, are they bad? Could we get different results from this? Uh, and, and, and doesn't look good, but is actually bad in the kind of false positive narrative that you're seeing. Um, that's more or less just needs to be defined by the bucket and then discovered by interacting. And that's why I said before to the page you question and being able to unravel each hit and have that paper trail and understand so we can exactly re-go through this entire bucket of users that have this type of behavior, understand what might have caused them to do this at each step, kind of replay mm -hmm. through those hits. Yeah. On, the, on the column of users, if John went to it 10 times and already went to it once, does it add him 10 times? Yeah. Uh, there's a concept of uh, unique users, which they'll marry some users, uh, but users are already kind of unique. So unique users is if Jan goes on his cell phone and his computer and they know those are the same person. So that'll even marry those. But uh, if, from the user's report, uh, it only adds a user. However, sessions is exactly the metric you're talking about. Now, if, you're on, if, we're just, if you two are the only ones that visit the site and you want 10 and you want 1, users will be 2, sessions will be 11. Did you say 10 and 1? But, but uh, yeah, that's, that's how that works. So session is uh, frequency. And then page, pages per session is how many interactual at any page, how many pages they're interacting with per those individual sessions. So you can say people are usually getting 14 pages deep or 8 pages deep or like how far are they going into our content. So that's a way to measure like, you know, if we need to figure out ways to keep them in here longer or do we need to redirect them somewhere else. I'm going to jump through a lot of these because we won't have time to go through everything if I stick too long on that. Burnt. So custom and dimensions and metrics are Almost exactly what we were just looking at, where I said like location and those different things, but you define them. Now this is where that PII conversation comes in, because this is where we're deciding what's going in there. And this is your specialty. Uh, was. This is my previous role, but yeah, this is where code starts to come in, and then you're deciding where does this information come from. So if I want to, one of the common metrics that uh, I used to track was I would keep an average until the first add to cart. So like certain information, so like how many pages does the average user go to before they hit that first add to cart? Um, and, and different things, just uh, you come up with different metrics or things that you might want to measure that aren't already out of the box on with Google Analytics. And some of them you might be able to get to doing calculations on what's already in the interface, but some of them you just get creative with. Um, so like uh, scroll depth is a great one for here, like I talked, like uh, what is the average scroll depth per session or like, um, or for individual hits, like how far are people scrolling on the page, stuff like that. But uh, uh, basically, dimensions are strings and metrics are numbers. Is the easiest way to say that. <laughs> it's a, uh, that the only reason there's two different is because we can do aggregations on metrics and we can't do aggregations on strings. So uh, that you come up with strings and numbers. At the end of the day, that's the only reason there's two different fields. It's just so they can do aggregates on one of the fields and they force it to a type. 
Um, so uh, the, when you define a dimension, there's a way in which you can link it to the data. So those dimensions I talked about before also follow these rules, but when you're defining them is when you have to think about the rules a little bit. So a user, uh, I'll go back to the question that you had. So the users are for a person over time. So just generally, if we've identified as this person, this data will be tied to that person. And that information will be the last time you set it. Whatever it is, it'll be the last time you set that on that user. Uh, session, uh, I don't know if it's up there. Um, session metrics are basically this individual session. So the last time this metric was set in the session is whatever value it is, the last thing it was set. Um, then you have the concept of hit, which are every time a hit goes up, whatever the value was, that's it. And then we have no concept of history on these. It's just this information is tied to this individual hit. Uh, and then you have the concept of product, which is basically exactly like hit, but it's tied to a product. Just curious, how many codes do you have for gender? I saw gender up there a couple of times. <laughs> Yeah, typically two, but I don't know in 2019 if we can continue that pattern. Right. Just curious. It's in the news today. Huh. Um, so I talked about this earlier with uh, source medium. This will make a lot more sense once since we were looking at that dashboard. This will be kind of intuitive. So when you click on different links, uh, we got to know where you came from. So if they click on those ad links, we know they came from Google, but we were saying Google organic versus Google paid advertising. So how do we cut those up? We have to have so we as a like, kind of tagging community, the people that are collecting this information, had to come up with a standard. Uh, and there isn't completely a standard, but uh, close. Most people uh, abide by this. It's called a UTM parameter. Uh, fun fact on top of that, it's called a UTM parameter because when Google bought uh, or created Google Tag Manager, they actually bought Urchin Tag Manager to, as the underlying software, and Urchin called theirs UTM parameters, and Google left that in as a not. So Google still used Urchin uh, urgent parameters as their things, and that's why they're called UTM. So um, uh, basically, the UTMs can be UTM source, UTM medium, and UTM campaign. So let's say I'm coming from, I'll just use AdWords as an example. Uh, the, the source is going to be uh, Google, the uh, medium is going to be PPC, pay per click, uh, or maybe CPC, cost per click. Uh, it's usually PPC. Uh, and then the campaign of AdWords that is tied to that spending. So that we could say, I know in AdWords I spent $10,000 this month on running this campaign. And then so I can, cut, I can tie that cost and then go into my analytical data and make that bucket of users, what is the revenue I got back from that? How many clicks did I get? How many new users? What sessions? How is that performing? So there's a system in which we can bucket people based off of the different campaigns and spend things that we're doing and then go take that analysis from the dashboards and fake them back. So uh, campaign traffic is basically done through URL tagging with UTM parameters. Uh, and here's basically the breakdown. You can also have uh, content. That's another one for people that are, like I said, the news and, 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 and social sharing worlds that aren't as focused on uh, like e-commerce. <coughs> they don't have a, a natural concept of revenue other than ad and views so they can pay off of their ad networks and the number of ad streams. So this is an example of the breakdowns of what might funnel in. So you might have a campaign across multiple different sources and multiple different times. What is linked to you? I like from the way you use what, what is vanity? What is it? What is vanity URL? Vanity URL? I actually don't know. Uh, I think it's more or less just a uh, a cleaned up link. It's just a URL to send that looks better than where you're actually going to land because ultimately when you're Links get all ugly. I've never heard that before, but that's what I think. That's I pulled this from. Yeah, me either. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, more than likely, a band URL is when they shorten the URL and make it prettier before you have to go to like a monstrosity when you get all the query parameters pulled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can read it. You can read it. A vanity URL is a descriptive, memorable, and pronounceable URL usually used to redirect URLs from one location to another. In the simplest terms, a vanity URL is a long URL that has been converted into a customized short link. Yep, that's more or less. Yeah, yeah, that's, what, that's what I figured. So, uh, one of the, the really the last piece of Google Analytics that I haven't touched on, which is a good time because we'll probably be very quickly. 
goals. So goals are interesting. It's it's. I'll use SIP as an example here. This is probably a good example. So let's say that we switch to like an uh, a kind of like an online signing up. So and we want to know how many people we're going to sign up for a class tonight. So the goal with, for the website would be for someone to sign up. And let's say 15 people came and eight people signed up. We would want to see the funnel of what is the percentage of people that hit this site where only there was a button to sign up versus the people that fulfilled that goal and did it. So what you're doing is you're tying a goal to a purpose and the way that goal is fulfilled is either with a page view or an event. In this case, my example would be the event of clicking that button. We would tie an event to registered for session and then we would have a goal for and how many sessions did someone register for a session. So uh, what a goal is, is some action that we've identified as uh, maybe monetary, maybe not monetary, uh, a thing that we want succeeded when people come to our website. It's a success. So of all the ways that we can win, a new user signed up, uh, they cashed in a coupon, they actually bought something, like whatever it is, you're just identifying some behavior. Uh, Google Analytics stock, uh, if you don't have the paid version. There, there's a, I didn't talk about this earlier. There's, this is, Google Analytics is free. GTM is free. So all these softwares you guys can interact with. Tonight. If you're doing it on a business level, like higher scale, that's where you get into the 360 paid license. But on a regular scale, for just setting up like your own blog or something like this, you guys can go down and play with these tonight. They're absolutely free. They have lower limits and higher sampling rates on the information that you're coming in, but it, it, it'll work just the same just for getting started with it. Uh, but uh, what I was going to say is, so with goals in the standard version, you get 10 goals starting out, uh, and then as you pay for the higher licenses, you can get more gold added on. Um, so we give some examples of uh, like what could be a conversion, so like clicking on a buy now, sign up to receive emails, making a purchase, uh, creating a new user account, anything that would be a goal of a website, it could be a goal of Google Analytics. I want to show you what one of the funnels might look like. So here's an example of goals. So one is like a registration page or an email verification page. They just want people to get there. It's a destination goal. And then there's event-based ones where it's like the steps of different registration. Uh, the reason that there's actually different steps is there's a goal funnel, which I'll show in a minute. But you can say in the past seven days, how many people actually filled out each of these goals? So you get numbers to see like how many people am I getting that are actually doing the things that I think is a win on my website, uh, not just the behavioral information, but you know how many wins did I get? So setting up uh, uh, the, the funnel is we want to see how many people made it to the landing page versus the, the uh, purchase page. So they, we have this campaign where uh, we want you to land here and then uh, go through these deals and then hopefully all those people that saw that information went and purchased. What a funnel is going to be is you're just going to see top level number, 100 people landed, and out of those 100 people, a smaller number, like 50 of them converted. And you can get more creative with those steps. So I'll, I'll use the e-commerce funnel, which is one of the more common funnels that I talked about earlier. Um, how many total uh, impressions did a product have? How many times did that product get clicked? That number is going to, at best, be 100% of the one above it. Each time, you can have more clicks than what people actually saw. So it goes to how many people clicked uh, from the impressions, from the clicks, how many people added to cart, from the added to cart, how many people made it through checkout step one, two, three, and then ultimately purchased. And it's a funnel that goes down, and you can analyze those funnels. Uh, same concept here with different, you know, you might have content pages that they, you want from this content page to go to this content page to download a webinar, or to, you know, whatever it might be. You're identifying a sequence of steps that you're trying to design a pattern of behavior for users to go by, and how many people are actually going through that. And then as those numbers drop off, you can identify problems in that funnel. If you have huge drop-offs, it's like, oh, nobody's going from step three to four. What's going on between there? So, and then you can hyper-analyze and find the, the instances in those situations. That's a bucket of people that we now know. And then it takes an analyst to go to that page, look through it. Is it a UX problem? Is it, you know, what's the problem that's causing most of that? Does problem distinguish keystrokes from, from the mouse uh, It depends on what you're tracking. So they don't, you define what gets sent to GA, so this program doesn't actually just collect keystrokes, so it's your JavaScript that's tracking it that has to determine that. Like uh, GTM, GTM does some of that auto tracking, so we'll get to that in the GTM part, but ultimately what ends up in Google Analytics is whatever code you've written to send it up there. So if you write code that listens to keystrokes and sends it up, then yeah, it would do. Yeah. And GTM is the software we're going to use to 
to basically get that information going up. So, and it has some auto click, uh, and it's not keystrokes, but it's like form submissions and things like that. Um, I don't think it tracks keystrokes at all. But yeah. Okay, uh, I don't think pizza's here yet. Uh, I guess I can start going into GTM, and then we would break. Um, yes. I have a question, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I apologize if I missed this earlier, but uh, are these analytics tied into uh, mobile applications as well? Yes, so 90% of what I've covered is a little bit more targeted towards web. You can set these up in mobile. It takes a more engineering and a more complex setup. Uh, concepts are pretty much the same. You have a screen view instead of a page view. Uh, anybody that's on Android development knows, knows that you're not really painting screens, and then a screen's cut to like four different things, and then anything could change visually at any time. So it's a lot more complicated to set up if you because uh, a screen paint isn't necessarily a screen paint in Android. You could be just be switching the, end, the actual thread that you're working in, so you need to decide is it a full screen paint or a thread paint. So the actual coding and setting it up is a lot harder, but yes, there is Google Analytics Mobile and Google Analytics AMP. So anybody that doesn't know, AMP stands for Amplified Mobile Page. Uh, it's basically uh, for people like our friend over here that doesn't like to be tracked. Uh, <laughs> it is very small. You have your, you have a JavaScript language with almost everything ripped out of it. You can track almost nothing. You can write almost no code. It's basically back to GeoCities websites where it's plain HTML and CSS. You got nothing going on there. Very very limited tracking. Like almost no user stuff. Uh, they have. A container for amps and analytics for amp pages as well. Um, so yeah, they pretty much cover. You can cover anything. Would that be compiled as a separate report then? It or would be its own property. Okay. So when I went through, like you have your accounts and the different properties. So uh, the the reason I'm saying entities is like these are examples of websites. Then start throwing apps into those examples. And they're all their own property. Whatever entity you're tracking against gets its own property. And then you can cut that up with views with the different filters or how you want to see them. Uh, I'll get started on GTM and then whenever yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So I want to explain what a tag is because uh, it took me forever to even realize what was going on in this, but it's kind of funny. So when I talked about those GIFs earlier and what was going on, you'll hear people say, well, just add my Facebook pixel, uh, add my Facebook tag. Well, what are these words? What are we calling this? And why can't we get to a uniform standard of what we're calling things? I'll tell you the reason why we're calling them tags now. The reason they were called a pixel in the early days, let's go back to GeoCities, like way before we had uh, the, like great JavaScript uh, frameworks and the ability to send you know, like post requests very easily, and things were a lot harder, and we were working with SOAP APIs. On the web, the easiest way to just hit another URL was to load it as an image. We realized, well, when I load an image, I'm pulling that in from you know, a CDN or wherever that thing's coming from. So if I do that with query parameters, and there's not actually an image there, I'm just pretending to hit an image, and I have query parameters in which a server will load the image, but actually process those query parameters for and store them. Uh, that's the easiest way for me to send that information across. So people started making one by one invisible pixels as the way to send information. They started calling them pixels. So everybody in the world calls them pixels, but nobody's using image tags to send information. Anymore. I mean, a small subset are, but it's, it's not used as much. So then we started putting them in script tags. So we started writing JavaScript and doing the same things with JavaScript and sometimes generating, even generating the image from JavaScript as a lazy way to do it. Um, or just sending the request ourselves or people with their own packages. But in reality, all of this was in HTML, which everything in HTML is called a tag. So they're like, why don't we just call it what it is? It's a tag. And no matter what, it's a script tag or an image tag or whatever it is. So now when we say like marketing tag, it basically means any of these possible ways to send that post request to some server and get that information off. But that's, I, I like to explain that first because so many people use so many different words in this world and it's, they all mean the same thing. So I'm gonna go over GTM structure first to kind of get you guys familiar with what you're looking at. Uh, so GTM, not too unsimilar the, to Google Analytics has the concept of an account. So you have uh, just a hierarchical rule. Well, this is a company's version of this. And then each instance or a container, similar to property, it's an instance of what you're tracking against. So when I said before that a GTM container was this giant JavaScript compiled object that was minified and optimized just for running these things, each container is an instance of a version of that object that you're wanting to pull in. So, uh, and they will work actually side by side on the same site, but I'll get into that later because it's a little bit more complicated. I'd rather understand the concepts a little bit better first. But uh, basically, a container is each entity that you're trying to track against. 
is, is the first way to kind of understand it. Within that entity, this is something that's kind of new, and not a lot of TMS has handled this very well. They have the concept of workspaces. Anybody who's familiar with Git, it's checking out other branches. So I can be working on some kind of new Google Analytics feature while you're trying to do a Facebook pixel, and then my buddy over here is trying to do an average pixel. And we can all do that at the same time, as long as there are no merge conflicts, we can pull them into master whenever we want. Master being the black environment. Um, so it's, it's kind of convenient because what would happen before workspaces is uh, on a Friday, uh, I just put new analytics changes on Wednesday that were needed for some marketing campaign that's gonna run over the weekend, but then somebody previously had broken code that was behind my commit history, and that went live, and they're like, we have to ax all this and roll back because it's breaking the site. Now that code can't live separate, and we would have to, you couldn't pick and choose what was going in. Now that you can branch out, treat it like Git, you can roll back to certain versions, just jump basically nodes, and, and skip certain publishes, which was a huge step in the tagging world, because if you think about it before, it was kind of, before there was even tag management systems, so an ability for us to do like this marketing pixels outside of the normal prod build of an app, uh, you were basically stuck in the build of that current app. So if we do releases every three weeks, and you have a marketing campaign coming out in four weeks, best get it in this week, because if not, you're not getting that pixel in front of marketing campaign. That's one of the major purposes of using a tag management system, is being able to be agile enough with this really lightweight HTML stuff, organize it into one place, and be able to control the builds in kind of a a better way. So this is uh, generally the overview of what you're looking at with GTM. So this is what it'll look like when you first land on the page. Uh, you've got the concept of tags, triggers, and variables. Uh, I'll give some analogies on what those are in a minute. Um, we've got preview and submit. Preview is a way to kind of look at your work that you have in staging on the live site right now without taking it live for everyone else. Is it live for just you? So if you make changes, I can see, okay, what am I taking live before I actually have to do it? So if you're making different, you know, uh, you want to take a tag live, make sure that it's tracking correctly, uh, get everything, all your ducks in a row, you can go ahead and click that preview link. It's going to let you know what would be live if you hit that button, but rather than sending it out to the world, just on your uh, This is your actual code. So this is the identifier for this container. If you were to click on that button, it would give you the JavaScript snippet that you need to add to the page to get this container on the page. Like I said before, it goes in the head or first thing in the body. Bottom of the head, first thing in the body, one or the other. It's really negligible, but people like to fight over the timing that is like 0.4 milliseconds of difference between the two. Uh, choosing your workspace, like I said, like Git branches style thing, they're checking out different. Uh, it's, there's always a default workspace. Uh, they do that so that you can always, if you're doing it through programmatic API stuff, there's always a name of a workspace you can grab. And then from there, uh, free users, if you're not 360, get two workspaces, other workspaces to work in, and then you it increases from there based off of your contract. So uh, the larger companies that have lots of things going on and have lots of different branches pulled out at once. Their merge conflict tool is not good though. So uh, know what you're doing if you have a merge conflict in GTM because you'll probably have to rip some of it out and put it back. <coughs> so, uh, it's good that you can work simultaneously, but it is not like Git Meld. You're going to have some problems pulling this stuff together. Okay, so that's more or less the interface. So I want to explain the concept of the data layer first. Uh, but before I even do that, I'm going to explain what tag, tags, triggers, and variables are, and then we'll go into the data layer. Uh, but basically, when you think of what we're tracking, there might be some certain information about this instance, about the user, about the campaign they came from, whatever it is. Throw any meta information out that needs to be collected in, in various sources. We're using Google Analytics as the example. The example could be anything. GTM has unlimited sources that you can send data out to. So just the stateful information that you need to send out to multiple sources. So it might be like user ID is a great example. You might want to send what my system calls a user ID to Facebook and Instagram, so I can link to the Instagram ID, to the Facebook ID, to my user ID, that kind of thing. So whatever you're calling that meta information, that's a variable. That's the what we're sending. What are we sending over to these people? <coughs> Triggers are, is it a button click? Is it a page view? Is it a form fill? Triggers are the, when are we gonna send this information to, to wherever we're gonna send it? And the tags are the how. Tag is the JavaScript that gets compiled that's going to structure that information and send it off somewhere. So tags tell us how are we going to get data from 
my website to Facebook. Well, there's a Facebook tag, and the tag is the how that's doing. What, what gets associated in that? A trigger. When do we send that Facebook information? On page view, on a button click? And then the variables are the what. What information are we putting into that Facebook you know, tag to be sent over to Facebook? So those, those are the three breakdowns of what those things are and how they all kind of work together. I wanted to get that straight before we go into data later, because data later mostly has to do with the triggers and variables, but understanding those uh, will make the data layer a little bit more clear. So let's think of a world without a tag management system. So you have to write this Facebook variable and you got to spend user ID. Well, I get the task and then another engineer on my team gets a task that he's got to track an Instagram and he wants to send user ID the same thing. And we're tracking it on the same button click. Well, what's going to happen? We're not going to talk to each other. We're going to write the same JavaScript. We're both wrote some jQuery function that grabs user ID from somewhere on the page. But I might have grabbed it from a different meta field than he did. It might have been stored somewhere else on the page. Where was user ID? Oh, I got it from the query parameter. Well, it gets stored on the form when it comes back, so I got it from the form. We're looking at different places for the same information. And we're both writing the trigger when it's going to happen. Duplicate code, duplicate values where we're looking. We need all this stuff to in the same place. So thus comes the idea of the data layer. When we're reading values to tag, let's make an object that holds all the values we're ever going to read. If we're going to start reading a new value, it goes in that object. We all look at the same place for that value, and then, let, instead of making it just an object, let's make it an array that receives objects. And that array will be overridden so that when things are pushed to that array, we can identify different keywords on it to identify different events. So if someone clicks on a button, all we do is take all the information from that button click that is meta information and a unique identifier for that button, push it to the array, and now we're all listening to that one spot and we know what happened and what information and what tags to fire based off of that. So what we did with the data layer was kind of take this universal people writing code everywhere and say, let's all get to one spot to find all the events we're going to track and all the information that's going to be tied to each of those events. Then when we fill out all of that information, we code one time. We go through the whole site, we find all the events that we want to track, all the information, push them to the data layer, and then we just tell GTM, listen to this one object, and then each time that object's interacted with, say, if it's this thing, fire this with this information. If it's this thing, fire this with this information. And since we have it all in a centralized place, we're able to kind of uh, treat it a little bit more systematically and a little bit more organized so then we can have a development life cycle around this and stop having people writing little pieces of JavaScript that's over the place. Now we can have a singular place that we're writing all of this in a structured way that we interact with. That's more or less the data layer. I wanted to kind of explain that concept before we get into this. Its job is to add information to GTM tags via variables. The variables are populated from the data layer, so those, that what that we're sending to things, the way that we tell GTM that those meta information is through a variable being defined and being pushed into that overridden array that I was talking about. Those variables are then used in tags via the syntax. You basically use uh, double, double uh, curly brackets and the variable name, and it'll hot swap those with whatever value that currently holds. And then it's also what causes GTM triggers to fire. So those objects that you're passing in, uh, based off of an event name that you can have in those objects, that uh, it will fire anything tagged to that event. And we'll get into that with triggers a little bit more. But the data layer is essentially just, uh, this explanation right now is more for non-devs, but if you're a developer, it is literally just an array that consumes JavaScript objects, and it's overwritten to do other JavaScript based off of the instruction of those. So when GTM pulls down that blob, it'll define the array for you, that data layer array, and it's already overwritten to have a set of instructions based off of the objects you're passing in based off of how you set it up in the world. So this is an example of how it works, kind of the flow of it. So when GTM spawns in, uh, it will define the data layer for you. So you can define it before with some set values in it. You cannot define it after, because what would happen? Uh, anybody that, that thinks about the array, if the array is overridden with a set of GTM instructions, and then you say data layer equals array, those instructions are gone. It's just an array. It doesn't do anything. So you can't, and you can't reset the data layer. You can always push objects to it, but you cannot redefine the data layer once GTM is done. You can define it before, and it'll assume whatever values are in there. When it's, when it's overriding it for you, it will pull whatever object you had in and push it into itself when it does the redefinition. Uh, so in this example, 
we defined a data layer variable in GTM. We'll look at the interface, how variables look a little bit later, but for now all you need to know is we created a variable that was living in the data layer and user ID. Now when we push an object with a value for user ID, and we have, this is the syntax I told you before, the double curlies, this will hot swap in this tag that value. So by sending this JavaScript value in on the page, it's telling GTM in its predefined JavaScript to look anywhere that this value comes in, and we reference this variable, hot swap that, and plug it in everywhere. So in my example where we need a user ID for a Facebook and Instagram tag, we would just put that macro, that double curly braces in, in both of those places, and then when we push through the data layer once, it's populated in both places. So it's the idea of taking that uh, the, all the different code and making it work in a singular place but reach out to all the places that needs to go to. This is an example of a push, but it's, it's basically just an object being pushed in a data layer. It's pretty much the previous tab. We'll talk a little bit more about variables. So I already gave the kind of idea that it's the what. You guys have seen the syntax of how you would get it into tags. We'll get the tags in a little bit. It'll make more sense where you're laying it in. But variables are essentially a, a set of different values that you can add in. GTM has built-in variables for you. So things that you might want to pass into tags. You've got page URL, page hosting, page path, refer, a whole slew of it. Basically any video interaction, when you said before key clicks, they have clicks, not keystrokes, but any click that happens. Uh, so they'll pass in what was the element or text or URL on any given click. And you can actually run triggers against those, like I want to track all clicks where the click ID was submit or things like that. So you can, you can use those values to set trigger rules for different things you want to happen. Um, the, the utilities are, I don't see them used as much, but if you're clever and you're trying to solve why something's going wrong, that's when those would really come in. So it's your environment name, so is this test, what's the container version. But if, you're, if you get into the concept, concept uh, the complex concepts like error tracking and, and just general JavaScript error tracking, anything like that, you can collect environmental information about where is my tag failed, where's my stuff going wrong. Or possibly not even your tag, just regular website development. It can, you can kind of hack GTM to be a testing tool in that way based off of that information. These are the types of, so the built-in variables were already pre-configured. These are the variables in which you can select that are custom. So let's say, so if I think of a particular client one, I can't say, day, but one of the clients that I work with, I, um, they were particularly long development life cycle. I do not write their backend code, so I can't get things to the data layer. I ask them, when you go to a page, pass the user ID to the data layer so I can read it, and they, they have to load that because there's no user ID accessible for me on the page. So um, there might be some in JavaScript somewhere, but I don't want to write that JavaScript everywhere, now that I have to do it, but they got this long life cycle, and they're like, well, we don't want to re-up, and it's going to take us forever to get to this, so you want to make the client happy, but the devs aren't helping you out. It's a hard thing. That's when you use something like a custom JavaScript variable. So rather than me writing that JavaScript to read it out of the query parameter or that meta tag that I talked about earlier, <coughs> you it once from one solid place, and now all the tags can read from that one piece of JavaScript. So rather than repeating that code in every tag that now needs to access that user ID that can't be passed from the backend for some reason, now I write one piece of JavaScript that will access that user ID and it can be referenced in every tag. Um, it's probably better performance uh, yes. as well. Significantly better, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, because one, you have one good piece of code that everyone's hitting, so it's going to be quality already, just because if everybody's going through it. And two, it's not repeated everywhere, so it's a much better performance to have that in a single place. Um, data layer variables are the first example that I went through. So you're saying, I'm going to have somebody pass it, whether it's us or somebody else, whoever it is, someone's going to pass this information to the data layer, read it straight from there. So it's literally attribute name as the variable, attribute name in the data layer. It's just that simple. Whatever attribute name comes in there will be hot swapped into your values. Uh, you can have lookup tables, which is a fun one. So basically, if you have a set of logic that if it's, if it's this value, I want this value. If it's this value, I want this value. And it's basically an object reading within an object. Uh, Google Analytics settings is a very valuable one. Uh, I don't know how deep we'll be able to get into this, but previously when setting up Google Analytics tags, 
Uh, you would have to, like I said before, you have a, a property ID, and then you would have to name the custom dimensions that you have. So when I said all those different dimensions that you would set up, you would have to name them and what their index are and what you're passing in for each one, and you'd have to repeat that for every analytics tag you did. Now they turn it into one variable. You set it up once, and you add that variable into every single tag, so you don't have to repeat that work. So in the past, it was a big pain to set up a new client on Google Analytics, because if you have 15 different tags tracking you know, the, the same information, you had to repeat and basically fill the same form 15 times. Now you stick it in a variable, pipe it over, and it's all done. So none of you, of course, would ever have to live that, except for the few that have worked with it in the past. Um, a uh, custom event. Isn't a variable that's triggered? Huh. A constant would be, a, oh, a custom event is just naming what, so essentially the event name that would be passed into the data layer. So you're just aliasing whatever event names you might have. Uh, a constant is, you know, you're going to guess it, a constant. Uh, you're just saying, I want this to always have this value in my code. Uh, that way, if you have something that people are going to reference in multiple places and multiple tags, you can set a constant. So let's say it's a great idea for a constant is my website URL. What if my domain changes? And I've got it hard coded in every single tag that I have. Uh, our company's a great example. We were InfoTrust LLC. We bought uh, InfoTrust.com. So we're no longer interested in InfoTrust LLC. We actually both redirect, so functionally operates the same, but we bought that other domain. So when we went through that process, had we not had the variable, that it was a constant that was infotrustllc.com that we could just take out the LLC, then we would be in a world of hurt going through every single tag that we have and curating all of them to make sure that we had to find that string and replace it. So if anything, there's going to be variable switching in the future. Set it as a constant, reference it everywhere, and you can flip it. Very good practice, easy, hot spot. So I already dove into this a little bit, but this is just an example of a custom JavaScript variable that you could use uh, to set something. So uh, not very valuable, but it, we're doing a math.ram to get a, a substring on date time. So it's just giving you a random. Okay. So I've already explained tags a few times. We don't need to dwell on this page for too, too long. But uh, a tag is basically how we're going to get information to something. These are the tag types. There's more than this, but these are more or less a, a good set of what we would be able to interact with. We'll, we'll, I described it before as like TurboTax-like forms. They're so simple, anybody can use it. Uh, these are the predefined templates that GTM just gives to you. And they're like, yeah, you just if you've got the information, just fill them in and we'll track it for you. Uh, Google Analytics, Universal Analytics being the one on top, obviously, we're highlighting that's what we're talking about tonight. But there's a number of different ones. You've got uh, Floodlight is ads, obviously Google ads. Uh, there's Facebook ones built in that uh, I don't see in this particular thing. There's a number of, uh, there's Bing, uh, tons of things that you can interact with where it's just sources they've already done for you. So if it's standard enough for Google to be able to pull it into their system, it makes tracking a lot, lot easier on you so that you don't have to manage. The big thing about that is, so when I used to be writing universal analytics JavaScript code, I had to upkeep with every single release. So if a new release is coming, and I service you know, 40 customers JavaScript packages that are running on all their production sites. I need to know that release is coming out. I got to get prepped. I got to write some script that alters all my JavaScript, make sure that it's all up to date, and I've tested it and done all this. It's all a template now. I don't have to do any of that work anymore. They make sure their code is tested and up to date, and I'm just filling out the values that should be happening. So it makes life a lot easier from those perspectives uh, as far as upkeep and being able to scale it out to lots of sites and really pick it up. Uh, the other big one to call out, which is highlighted, is custom HTML. Well, what if they don't have a template to track what you want to track? You obviously need to be able to track everything in GTM. So if it's, it's on anything that's simple tag, you just get that JavaScript snippet, put it in, fill happen, and your variable of how you want it to, or what information that you want it to track, and it'll send up. So anything you could just do, anything that would be custom HTML you would add to a page just to track, you can just add it in there. You do have to add the script tags. It's treated as purely an HTML field. So this is an example of what the templates might look like. Uh, used AdWords in this example, but this is just a Google Ads remarketing pixel. Uh, and with this uh, pixel, basically, uh, you would just have to fill in what's the conversion ID, and that's it. You're done. 
and now you add a trigger to when you want that to happen, and it will generate JavaScript, and you're good to go. There's other you can fill that in, and the more that you understand the platforms and what contextually that information makes, I, I understand for a lot of you this might be like, well, I don't really know what information you would want to pass into that particular form. Had you known the form and the platform, and you, you, you know what you're trying to track against, basically there'll be a field for all the information you can pass in. You had a trigger for when this should happen, and submit. Custom HTML, again, just works like custom HTML. So anything that you would be done outside of those forms, you paste it into this field, add the trigger when you want it to happen, Listen. You want to break so we can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. All right. Sorry to jump back in a little eating, guys, but we got a little bit more to go through, so I'll try to do it quickly. Um, so uh, this is a super cool concept. So, like I said before, you can add triggers to tags which is when you want to fire something. But how, uh, and people who live in this world understand that this is a, kind of an often occurrence. Uh, you might get a marketing campaign that you need to have a conversion on, but that marketing campaign stops next week. Well, you don't want to still be firing that JavaScript on your site. It's eating up bandwidth of your site load speed time for no reason. You're just running extra JavaScript for absolutely no purpose. So for site optimization, it's got to be gone. So you can pause and you can time block triggers. You can say, after this date, don't fire this anymore. So this fires on this event, but then on this day, stop firing. So what that allows you to do is to like basically sunset code and not have to come back on all these different dates, and then have you could have like a monthly meeting where you clean up all of the things that were timestamped that are over with. But that way you can kind of cycle and save code and not have to you know go back every time. Same as if something's not working, you can just pause it. So you don't have to remove all the triggers or take anything off. You can just say, hey, don't do this for now. We're going to fix this and then come back. Uh, you do have to publish those changes. So, this is what the Google Analytics tag looks like. We talked before, I'm probably missing this camera angle. Uh, we talked before, uh, it's basically like a turbo type one. So once I think that my tag type is gonna be universal analytics, the track type, page view, or it could be event, and we talked about e-commerce, or social. That's so, that your drop down is just gonna be those. And then I told you before for the settings variables, the things that we gotta set up to like, where is this gonna track to? What's my property ID that I'm sending this information to? Or, uh, or the other information that's been collected? Now there's a Google Analytics settings variable. And basically you plug that information in and add a trigger. If you're done and ready to send it, it'll do all of the JavaScript for you, just start collecting those things. So, very, very simple. Um, these are all variables collecting the different dimensions. So when you define, I want dimension one, to be user ID, you basically tell your macro that reads user ID, your macro that's reading the variable that we're passing some way or another, you're going to set that into your settings variable under that dimension index. And then when it sends up, Google Analytics doesn't really, there's string mapping that's happening behind the scenes, but to them, it's just dimension one. It doesn't have a name, it doesn't care that it's a user ID. It's just dimension one, dimension two, dimension three. And then within the Google Analytics interface, you're naming those numbers. You're giving them a purpose. This one is user ID. This one's type, page type, whatever. But once you have that mapping set up, you basically just have to find the values and all your variables and then replicate that mapping within the, that, that variable. And like I said before, you used to have to do this for every single tag that you had. You know, if you go through a reading that mapping, now it all is in a variable. So set the variable up once, slap it on all your analytics tags, you're good. So triggers, also known as firing rules, are basically when something's going to happen. Uh, it, there's uh, event-based ones, so when you do a data layer push, a data layer push should always have an attribute value where the attribute is event and the value is whatever's happening. So it might be form fill, it might be an add to cart, it might be whatever the thing you're kind of trying to track against. And whenever an event with the name of the event you set this trigger to be comes through, that trigger will, all, any tag with that trigger on it will fire. So that's how you do event page triggering. It's through data layer pushes with those object names. And then uh, all the URL ones can be like, you do it off page path. A lot of people will put triggers on host name, which sounds silly, but uh, if you get like loaded through an iframe and you don't want to track things, then it'll actually look at the page's full host name and then track it. Uh, anything that you would like, any of those complex kind of like scenarios or any uh, like different combinations of page paths or regexes, you can add in triggers. Any information that's available, 
you can use to basically run logic against like magic gray that contains equals is not any Boolean expression against those things. Uh, and that's essentially all triggers are, just the ability to say when something is going to fire and that when's always a tag. So earlier when you were saying the double curly cues, you were talking about those braces. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So the, the double curlies wrap a variable every time. Okay. And a variable... But it was that, what, that's what you're calling the double curlies? Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, double set. I couldn't curves. see when it was smaller, I couldn't yeah. see it. Exactly, yep. Yeah. And so. that's the denotion that this thing is a variable somewhere, and whatever value that variable currently holds is going to get hot swapped with those curly braces in that name. So it's a way to look up whatever that thing is, so you can find out, is it a constant? Is it a custom JavaScript? Did, did it come from the data layer? It tells you you'll have a set of instructions on where that thing is and how that information is being hot That's right. Yeah. It's a defined variable. Exactly. Go ahead, sir. Get this all set up. Is there an off on switch to this? I've been around where people have done it twice and they say, well, it's there, but we didn't turn it on. Yet. Um, maybe. So if a tag has a trigger, it's on. Unless it's paused. Okay. Earlier. So if a tag has a trigger, it's on. Right. Uh, then you have the concept of is the container on the site? Because you could technically turn it off by just removing the container entirely and that JavaScript can get in there. Uh, and then you can have rules for whether everything in that container is firing or not. So you could have some Boolean scenario that's checking and causing it not to fire. But uh, it, if the container is on the site, it will load all the tags. I didn't say that before. The container always loads all the tags. Whether it fires or not is a neat little trick where all the script tags are actually script text. And when it fires, it goes to script job. That's the way it fires it, it just swaps the type of it so that it's already loaded and on the page ready to fire and it's quote unquote firing, it's switching it to text JavaScript. So if the GTM container is there, it will load all your tags as text, text uh, or script tag text. Mm -hmm. And then if the trigger condition is met, it will fire. But whether that trigger condition is met depends on Boolean scenarios and how those are set up and what it might be. So you might see it fire in one scenario and not in the other. Wow. My experience is they wanted it on the site when they pride, but they didn't really, there wasn't going to be enough traffic to generate anything while we were um, going from the dev QA to pride. Yes. Yeah, there's also, there's there's environmental codes that you can say if the URL is this, yeah. you're in this environment, and it could be that it was turned on for one environment and not the other environment. So you can actually publish to environments based off of different codes so that if this environment's coming, pull this JavaScript down, and this one, pull this one down. So then it'll, that could also be the scenario that you're By in. environment, you mean like Bing or Facebook or? No, I mean literal website this is running on. So let's just say like, let's say there was www.7.org and there was uh, dev.7.org and test.7.org. Those are three different environments. Gotcha. So when we add that snippet in, we could tell it uh, oh, dev that's a dev.7.org run, but do not on www because we're not ready for product yet. Got so it. in that scenario, they might have said to publish the code in this dev environment, but then when they went to product, well, nothing's happening. And that's it's because it was published to a specific environment. Yeah. Um, the, the different types of, uh, I should break down the page view stuff because it's confusing the way that it's worded. Uh, essentially, uh, DOM ready means, which is also referred to as gtm.js, it means it's as early as JavaScript can start running. So the DOM's officially completed. We have a DOM object that can be written to now. It's loaded in. And that's as early as you can fire something as DOM ready. Then what we would call first paint, basically, like you're now able to kind of interact with the page. It's not done loading yet, but it's uh, like now you could click on something and it would work. Would be page view. And then uh, window loaded is like, we're done. It's, there's no more information being loaded. Anything that's loaded now came after the fact. Uh, under the other, uh, there, these are very used very often. The primary one is custom event. And like I said before, the way that a custom event trigger works is if in the data layer, an object is passed in with the same name. When you click custom event, you have to pass in a string. What name the event that you're firing off of? And let's just say product click. And then if, if an object is pushed to the data layer with the value product, click, they'll fire all tags that have custom event product click associated. So that's how you kind of map those all through the data layer. 
Uh, and then you can, if you want to, like systematically just track all clicks on your website, like some something needs to fire every time a click happens, or just link clicks, those two are used pretty commonly. And then you can also, with every one of these, add fully logical pieces on top of them. So you could say, I want just link clicks where the click text is submit, and it's only submit buttons that are link clicks, or whatever it is, so you can add logic on each of these and make them as specific as you want to. And then these triggers apply to tags, which then use variables to set up. And that's the kind of holistic picture. So I talked about this a little bit at the beginning. I want to jump to what it looks like. This is our website. This beautiful Amanda. She lives in San Diego now. Um, so uh, once you go into preview mode, this is an example of what you might see. So what these numbers are here down on the bottom is actually the state of the data. That's, uh, they, it's not zero index, which is funny. Uh, so it's, that's actually the sixth push, but uh, each individual data layer dot push will show up as a number on there. So you can see the objects and events that are coming in. So and then you can also, from those different objects being pushed in, see what the current value of each variable that you have in each tag is. So you can go in and look like, okay, what is my user ID value right now? Because it should have been pushed to the data layer and read correctly by now. Or if I have that custom JavaScript variable that should have read this metadata off the page at some point, has that worked correctly? Yet? So you can look at all the tags that are being fired on this page, what the values of each variable could be, and then uh, from the data layer, what the, the, if you click the data layer, it's basically going to tell you the same information as summary. It's just going to give you the raw JavaScript what the data layer represents, which you can also find by right clicking the page, clicking inspect, and typing the word. So uh, yeah, just interacting with the object itself. I tend to stay in the console and interact with the console a lot more. Uh, I don't use this as much. This is a great learning tool when you're getting in and trying to understand states and how things might be changing and how they're interacting with each other. Um, no one else did that. Wasn't planning on jumping off the slide deck, but I am going to do that with the switch interaction. Kyle. Yes, sir? Do you have an idea? Pretty close to the Yep. So if I wanted to interact with this, I can actually look at all the tags that fired on this page and tags that did not fire. And if I click into an individual one, I can actually scroll down to what the firing triggers were, which this one's all pages. I picked a bad example. Let's look at scroll down. Let's try this one. So this is for tracking for a hub button. And I can look at the check marks on my trigger for what things evaluated the truth. So on this page load, the URL has to match the dot star regex, which is pretty exclusive. Uh, and, uh, and it had to be GTM load. So that's basically all pages. It's kind of a silly trigger rule. So it's saying fire anytime it's GTM load, the regex matches dot star. But I can literally look at the trigger and why attack fired or did not fire based off of the tooling. And then if I wanted to look at the values, of different variables. I could just scroll through here. And these are all like, if you were to surround these in brackets, I would get, you know, the macro thing for these. So each of those surrounded brackets, I could find out what's the value of each of those that's getting hot swapped in. Jeff, you want to slide there? So that's more or less preview mode, and I'm giving you this stuff through there. Uh, one of the last things to talk about is publishing containers. So, um, how do you take it live? Once you're doing, doing these changes, they're not immediately live. You'll just have on-stage changes in your workspace. When you click the publish button on the top right, which isn't up there right now, but it's a green submit button. It used to be a red publish button for UX reasons. People were afraid of it. They turned to blue and they did submit. Uh, <laughs> so uh, once you push that button, uh, it'll bring your changes live, and then you'll get this nice, unique history of versions. Looks a lot like Git. Uh, you can see the versions. You can have main versions. Know when you did something. So if something catastrophically failed and you got to roll back, you just click one of these little buttons right here, roll back to that version, you can publish it, it's instantly live in the state it was before you took that sort of time. So that's generally how publishing works. Uh, one of the last things that I'll talk about, so we have a product at InfraTrust that uh, makes a lot more sense now that you guys understand how this world looks, it's called Tag Inspector. Uh, one of the reasons that this world can be kind of crazy is because we're using these huge organizations that have tracking over you know, 40 different services they're sending out, and they're pulling in different JavaScript pieces from CDNs they don't own, which are pulling in JavaScript pieces they don't know about, which are pulling in ones that they don't know about, because deeper and deeper and deeper, and you have no idea what's being collected from where. And the next thing you know, Newegg.com's like, we've lost 50,000 people's credit cards information because we didn't know what was firing on our site. 
So you can understand when you're just loading in these random CDNs, that can be kind of a security issue. You don't know what's getting tracked, and you want to know what's going on. Thus, we created the product tag inspector. What Tag Inspector does is it'll call the site and it'll find out all of the network uh, that you're sending information to, what tag sent that information, who's responsible, crawl out the tier, and we'll give you a, a nice tiered report of all your taxes and everything you're tracking over all places. You can then review that and understand who's firing what, where they shouldn't be, and get a full audit and kind of make an actual thing. So it's a, from a lot of these big companies, this is just a huge security piece of mind for them to use this product and to know, okay, what information am I collecting and when, and am I going to get in trouble? They can really know that they're only collecting the right thing. So they queue up a, a scan once a month, once a week, whenever they want to do it, and get the information over what's going on. We have two products within Tag Inspector. One is called Tag Inspector Real Times and one Scanner. Scanner crawls just like Google does through your website, find out all the information. It, it's a bot going through. Real time tracks your customer's information while they're there. It's, a, it's an actual individual tag that looks along all the other tags and, and mines data along with the user. So you can find out information for those little scenarios that the crawler didn't find. And we can get a more holistic view of what that tagging report looks like when other things are firing off different button clicks that our crawler might not have put. So um, that's generally the product over. And just one tip that this happened actually this week, we just hit over 1 million scans around. For. Do you have trial version of Evernote? What was it? Do you have trial versions for the uh, I think, I don't know about Tag Inspector. I'm pretty sure, I know that you can sign up, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a free tier that you can run a small amount of scans, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not positive. Real time, probably not. Because that's uh, it's a little more of a setup process. You're typically working with a consultant to get the thing set up. But for the scanner, you might well, be able to. Scanner, right? Yeah, for the scanner, you might be able to run. I think you might be able to do it with one page scan, like one time. For, uh, but you might have to go through the sales team for that. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. This is my last point of wrapping up. I won't go too far into this since we're over time. So these are like the more complex things going on within this world. So this is a high level. Just how do you use these tools? What's going on? How do I get used to the the web world? Everything that we've looked at tonight can be done from an API. You don't ever have to touch any of these interfaces. And that's uh, probably a year ago, it was 90% of my job. Was I'm working with these large CPC organizations. I've worked with a couple organizations with 600 to 1,000 different websites. Uh, I had to run a migration of the signal tag management system for a certain company over to the Google Tag Manager system. I was a one-man team on that project. Uh, there was a lot of people helping me collect the information, but as far as coding and rolling it out, and I was only able to do that because of these APIs. Uh, I was able to architect a new tag management solution, move them completely to a new thing, uh, get all of their data, their data layer set up, all of this information pulled together on a massive scale. It took me probably a month, uh, and that's like a lot of people would spend a year in full teams doing that, and it's only because of that API. Um, so everything that we've done tonight completely could be programmatic, and that's one of the best things for most of these paid services. Like I said earlier, both of these are free. Most of the paid ones, so if you think like Signal, Insight, and Telium, which are other TMSs, or Adobe Core Metrics, uh, uh, or what well, is not Adobe Core Metrics? It's IBM Core Metrics and Adobe Analytics, it's just called. But um, they're all paid and don't have half the API functionality that Google has. So that's one of the huge things about these products that not only are they free, but you can do crazy software stuff with them. And you can do it at scale and you can do it fast. Um, custom tasks, I'll touch on this really quick and just move right by. So basically think of it as a callback, callback function for every analytics hit you've ever had. So when you send in a hit and it's successful and you want to do something else, so imagine if you want to send your Google Analytics hit up to a database somewhere or you wanted to curate certain ones, or you wanted to filter certain information and pipe it somewhere else, it basically allows you to take all your analytics hit and pipe it out everywhere else. So uh, it's basically an overridden callback response from Google Analytics where you can pipe that information anywhere. Uh, really clever uses for really developers, uh, really good developers. You also can mute, uh, kind of mutate the hit before it goes up with custom tasks. So if you have a problem where you can't put a filter on your data for some reason, you could actually filter it with code before it ever even actually went up. So custom tasks are like pretty advanced Google Analytics stuff, but if you get really clever with this stuff, you can do a lot of things that would take people weeks and minutes. So a really cool thing. Uh, so I imagine everybody's heard about GDPR, which is changing the space of uh, analytics pretty quickly. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, basically uh, the EU decided that they were going to nail down what is like data protection for an average person. And if you're 
cotton violation of that, the fines are, I think, like 1% is the highest, 1% of revenue. But it's like something ridiculous. And when you think of these huge corporations, corporations, 1% is ridiculous uh, amount of money. So uh, basically, if you're caught collecting information, you shouldn't be collect, which is basically the personal, personal identifying information. So that's more or less what GDPR is. It kind of changed the landscape because everyone's having to change what they collect and how they collect. Tag Inspector really benefited from GDPR because now we can tell you what you're collecting, what you're not collecting, uh, and when you would be in violation for that. And then uh, ITP is uh, more or less what uh, like browsers and Safari stepping towards, basically trying to get rid of third-party cookies entirely. <coughs> and, and you check which third-party cookies you can have. So things like that session calculation, the things that I was talking about earlier, gone. Like all of that is gone. So the way the tracking world works right now, completely thrown on a loop for certain browsers like that, and that's going. So what you're seeing is people trying to create browsers where people can take back the ownership of their data, but also not kill it. We want to see a space because data collection isn't bad as long as it's done correctly. So we're seeing kind of a war in the space right now as far as let's just shut down all data collection and not have it at all. And it's like, well, that's how we got targeted ads, and that's why I don't see ads for lipstick because I have no interest in it, and I want to see products that I'm interested in. So collecting data isn't bad, but we also don't want to sell data that we don't want out there. So the user should have the option to carry it. And uh, ITP is kind of in a strange way a step towards that. So what they're working on <laughs> is basically shutting everything down, and what that's going to cause is a player to emerge that has full control. So uh, hopefully we see scenarios play out where tracking isn't completely shut down, and instead we have browsers where the users give it control, and even a possibility where users can monetize their data. So I'll give my data to give me a coupon, or I'll give it, but you might see the scenario changing. So the game is definitely changing, but it's still exciting, and there's a lot of out there. That's about it. Does anybody have any, uh, <laughs> does anybody have any closing questions? I have a question. Okay. Uh, another presentation uh, talked about ad fraud. It's like um, the user clicks on what they think is an ad, but there's like six layers of ads under there that are getting paid. So That's getting killed. Is there, but, is there a way to, is there such a tool to detect that? Not to detect, but nobody's buying them anymore because, like I said earlier, what are we using these buckets for putting users in for, right? You want to see if AdWords is doing good, if Bing's doing good. Well, if your ad network, if you're actually tracking it with analytics, and people click on all six of those, five of them are bounces, guaranteed, because you didn't go through. So if you look at your number of clicks, first one, number of people coming into your website off of that, because if you've got a click for each of those, but they only actually went to one website. So already, if you're adding up the numbers from the ad network versus actual traffic, that's going to be incorrect. Plus, they're not converting on anything, because they never actually came to your website. So you can have all the clicks in the world, and if it's cost per click, which is why I was saying like uh, uh, it, you know, there's pay per click, and then there's pay per view, and then there's different metrics. But if it's cost per clicks, the ad networks, that's how they're making their money. They're like, yeah, you clicked on six, but we only showed one, and they're collecting that paycheck. But who's going to spend money with them again if you're never getting money back on that? So if you're actually measuring ROI and you understand that, they will phase themselves out. As people like my company get a hold of the companies that are paying these wrong companies, we'll slowly phase them out of existence because the, the, the dishonest behavior is not is never profitable. So it'll kind of phase itself. Well, they're making money now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it'll end. Uh, that's that's basically want. when you get to the source of truth and where that data is, it's just they'll understand we're never getting anything back from this. So they basically prey on the companies that have no concept of spin versus what's coming in. Is that it? Thank you. Oh, thank you.